What is up, everybody? Uh, welcome to Ginger Runner Live number 89. I realize that uh, as soon as I start talking, I have to make sure that I mute the video and audio here on my computer. Uh, very excited about tonight's show because there's a lot of events coming up this weekend, a lot of races coming up. We have with the race director uh, for one of those big events, Havelina 100 uh, is coming up Halloween weekend. The race director, Jamil Curry, is here on the show. And I'm not going to only talk about Havelina. I also want to talk to him about something that he did over the summer. We've had him on the show before uh, in the midst of it, but it's called the Slam of the Damned, which is four of the hardest hundreds in the world. Uh, we're going to talk to him all about running all four of those this year. In fact, this summer. Very excited to have Jamil on the show. Sit back, relax. Welcome, everybody. Very excited. Uh, let's get on with Ginger Runner Live number 89. Ginger Runner. Yes, yes, yes. Awesome. Uh, thank you for tuning in live. Um, or if you're watching this as an archive version, thank you for watching it regardless. We're listening on podcast for that for that matter. Uh, if you are watching live, you the chat room is already talking about how many of you take your Monday nights and you enjoy spending the time here with, with us. And I think that's really pretty awesome. Um, and I'm honored to have you guys here Monday live. And uh, I'm, I'm really excited about tonight's show because I've had him on the show before, uh, twice already now. Um, he's a good buddy of mine. Just featured him in the recent uh, Ginger Runner Adventure Club video that I posted la last week over at Hangover Trail, which is in Sedona, Arizona. He is an Arizona resident. It is the man with pretty much the best hair and beard in older running, uh, honestly, uh, is Jamil Curry. Jamil, what's up, buddy? How are you, man? Ethan, how's it going? Great to be back. Thank you so much for having me. Of that course. Video, that video, by the way, is fantastic. I mean, it was such a fun day being out there, and it's it's great to see the final product of that. It was so much fun. We got maybe some news to share about that trail in the future as well. So we'll kind of yeah. we talk um, about that. Point. Yeah, for sure. I like. For those of you who don't know or who haven't seen it, go check it out. It's on the YouTube channel, uh, The Ginger Runner. But I was in Arizona earlier this summer, and Jamil's like, hey, we got to run together. And I was like, well, where's a good place to go? He's like, we got to do this trail. And he took us to uh, the Hangover Trail, which is incredible. It's in Sedona, Arizona. I, I didn't know what to expect. I'm like, it's going to be death-defying, and there's going to be lots of exposure, and I'm going to be running with people who are far more advanced than me. Uh, it just turned into a really awesome afternoon, Jamil. Like you were the best tour guide because that trail was incredible. Yeah, I mean it's it probably I mean one of my favorites in, in all of Sedona. Um, you know, you get the perfect red rocks. The views are incredible, and yeah. you're kind of running along that slick rock. It's just you know like nothing else I've really been on. So it's great. Yeah, I had never seen that type of rock formation in person. I'd never run on trails like that. I mean, it, for the most part, it wasn't a trail. It was, you were following the blazes. And uh, there was a, there was one point, it's in the video, where we're kind of going up a mound of exposed red rock. And I'm like, is this really where, <laughs> is this really where the trail goes? And sure enough, the blazes take you all up onto the red rock formations. It's, it's absolutely uh, incredible. And that's your backyard. You can pretty much run all of those trails whenever you feel like it, right? Yeah, I mean, more or less, it's, you know, that's probably like an hour and a half drive up. Um, so, but yeah, really easy access, uh, open year round. So it's great. Now, tell us a little bit about what's happening this weekend, because I imagine you are under the gun. The pressure is on. A lot <laughs> of things happening around uh, Aravipa running headquarters. Uh, what's happening? Yeah, we're, yeah. Not a lot of sleep is happening. Um, <laughs> Yeah, we're gearing up for the 13th annual Havelina 100. So right now, um, you know, the trucks are loaded, doing kind of last minute prep, um, getting all the bid numbers ready and just kind of double checking everything, um, checking all of our checklists and uh, yeah, getting ready for hosting, you know, the, the second biggest 100 miler here in North America. Um, you know, we're heading out to the park tomorrow to start dropping supplies and setting up. So it's really, an, it's like a week long, you know, commitment from us out there. Now, I have only heard the legend of the Havelina 100. Uh, we've, you and I have talked about it. I remember from last year, you're like, you got to come run it. Um, I, it's on the bucket list. I am uh, like, I was supposed to be there this weekend because I, I, I have been dying to go. I will be in New York running the New York Marathon this weekend and unfortunately unable to, to go to Havelina. 2016, Jamil. 
<laughs> I will 100% be there. Uh, the rumors and people have talked about it and I've seen videos. It's a party. It's it's a huge party with a pretty damn incredible race with amazing volunteers. Can you go into detail about what helps make Javelina uh, really special? Because it seems, it seems totally uh, unique and individual. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it started with the founder of the race, uh, Jerry Kilgariff. Um, she's a pretty wild character herself. Um, she's not around the sport much anymore, but um, she was very, very much in the scene, you know, about 13 to 15 years ago. And, you know, she likes to have fun with running and with the sport and, um, you know, wanted to just throw a party for her friends. Um, and they chose McDowell Mountain Regional Park just because it's beautiful. It's got, you know, the really amazing Pemberton Trail. It's, you know, kind of like a world-class mountain biking trail. And just the fact that, you know, you can loop around there and come back to your car and your, your family and friends can camp and hang out uh, just really lends itself to, like, a festival-type atmosphere. Mm -hmm. And we've really just developed that over the years. Um, you know, we've really encouraged camping and we do that for people coming in from out of town. You know, you can't really lug around all your gear, um, but we, we actually have tents you can rent from us. We'll set it up for you. All you got to do is, you know, just come in and check in and you know, put your bags and, and little sleeping bag in there. And um, it's, it's really nice. Um, come out and camp in the desert, come and run. And, you know, your family has a place to kind of hang out for the day uh, right there. Uh, just one of the facts about this race, which makes it unique and I think enticing to me, is that it is a loop style course, washing machine, machine style. So home base becomes kind of this beacon that you go through five, six times. How many is it? Yeah, so six and a half loops is the whole okay. race. Yeah. Which it, it seems perfect because, you know, you're you're suffering later in the race and you want to see your crew and you want to see your pacers and people in costume and uh i i think it, it sounds pretty damn amazing how many people do you have running so we have 516 uh registered in the 100 mile and we have 145 registered in the 100k i'm still getting emails people want to sign up on friday so you wow. know, we'll see we'll see how many start but it's a good it's a good size field for sure there's a great film um that uh, Project Hilaria just put out uh, kind of surrounding the race and some of the history and stuff like that. Uh, I didn't realize that it was such a tough race because in my mind, I'm like, oh, it's fairly flat. There's not a ton of elevation gain, but your finishing percentage is not that high. And it's a it's a pretty brutal, tough race. What what makes it so tough? Yeah, and that's quite surprising because you look at kind of the race on paper and it's a pretty easy 15 mile loop. Um, so the factors that I think are challenging is like you said, it's, it's awesome that there's the 15 mile loop and you're back at camp, but it's also a bit of a danger. Uh, it's easy to quit, easy to stop, especially when there's, you know, a fun atmosphere going on, you know, people are, sh are drinking beers, uh, eating pizza, hanging out. It's, you know, if, if you're at a really low point and you're hurting, you know, just people call it a day. Um, you know, they, I think sometimes they don't know that it can get better. Um, and so they just drop. Um, I think it's just because it's kind of convenient. If you're in a typical point to point hundred mile race, you, it's, you know, you have to wait an hour, hitch a ride with an aid station volunteer. Who knows? Like, it's very difficult logistically. You're almost better off just continuing and kind of walking it out. And I think that's more challenging at this one when you can just all of a sudden be done and, you know, sitting in your camp chair at your camp, hanging out with people. Um, so I, and I don't know, like, if people are devastated over it or, or what's going on. Um, another challenge is, you know, the loop is completely runnable and it's slightly uphill for the first half and then slightly downhill for the second half. So I think on that first loop, people... They're coming off the top side of the loop and like running seven minute miles. And it feels like it's so easy and they can do it all day, but they kind of trash their legs. Um, everyone is always way ahead of their uh, projected loop one split times. You know, we'll have like a hundred people on sub 24 hour pace or more. And it, you know, it turns out only about 20 people end up running that. So everyone is just, I think running a little yeah, they're running a little bit strong in the beginning just because it's easy. And, and with 
know, the energy is like hard to describe, but there's with, you know, 600 people running, like it's electric out there. The, the energy is just through the roof. And I think that gets, it gets to anyone. I mean, it's, it's exciting. It's uh, really fun. So I think that, you know, people, they start out a little too quick. And that is a cliche thing to say. Uh, we also, you know, there's no shade out on the course and we're in the desert. So I think um, you get a lot of heat issues during the day and then people are kind of dehydrated and then all of a sudden the temperatures drop as soon as the sun goes down and we'll see, we'll be treating like heat exhaustion in the day and then instantly we're treating like hypothermia because people are drenched in sweat. Right. They don't have a jacket and you know, next thing they know they're out there and they're freezing, um, just walking, walking through the desert. Yeah, it's the extremes. It seems like it's the uh, both extremes. Do you know what the weather's supposed to be like this weekend for your for the? Race? It looks like we're actually going to get a little bit of rain, probably Thursday, maybe Wednesday. Um, that's going to clear out, and I think it's going to be about seventy-five for the high and like in the fifties for the low, which is actually pretty good weather for us. That's perfect. Um, we've had, I think, a, you know, averages in the eighties, and we've seen like nineties before, if not a hundred. Um, at this event. So that's pretty good. Um, I mean, we're prepared either way. You know, if it turns out to be, it bumps up to 85, you know, we got unlimited water, t plenty of ice. We've got all that kind of stuff in place. So you know, there'd be no shortage of that out on the course. I imagine there will be some viewers uh, that will probably catch this at some point this week uh, who might be running. Any pieces of advice that you would give them having been the race director for so long and, and seeing and, and knowing so many finishers and struggles? Yeah, I would say mix in some walking breaks, even on loop one. Um, for anyone who's entering the race, they, everyone should be able to run an entire loop like without even taking a walking break. Like that would be fairly easy for anyone who's seriously, you know, considering running 100k or 100 miles. But I would say, uh, and the other thing is like they don't. There's no mountains to break it up. Usually, that's what I like to use. Yeah. You know, you hit a hill, you just walk up it, um, and that's a pretty good way to kind of pace yourself. And that's not possible here because, it, you know, it's it's all gradual runnable. So you got to kind of really be conscious and mix in those breaks uh, yourself. So whether that be you're gonna every twenty minutes you're gonna walk for a minute or something like that, but you know, use that as a tool. Um, another trick that I, has worked well for me on looped courses, because um, like obviously the most dangerous spot is the headquarters, the start finish. Right. Um, that's where you can easily quit. It gets more difficult out on the course. Um, so I always tell myself, like, just get get in and get out of the main aid station, uh, out of Havelina headquarters. So, you know, don't spend a lot of time there. And, and really, for me, like, I use this trick at, like, the Umstead 100 in North Carolina. It's mm -hmm. eight loops of 12 and a half miles. So, like... I knew once I started a loop, like I was going to keep walking, keep running, keep moving forward until I completed that loop. Like I wasn't going to turn around and like drop. So in my mind, as long as I left and started that loop, it was almost like I finished it. I just had to like walk it out or run it out. Right. Um, and that seemed to work really well mentally. It's just a little mental tricks like that um, can really help you, especially through a really low point. If you just tell yourself, I can't spend more than you know five minutes at the main aid station. I need to get out of there. Um, even at how terrible I feel, just get up, get out. I think that can be really key. Uh, so, uh, in the chat room, uh, Julie just joined us. We're talking about Havelina 100 uh, with Jamil Curry, the race director of the race. Um, what are things that people have to look forward to if they finish? I, I know that the party is, uh, is pretty legit. Yeah, so I guess once you're finished, or even when you're running, we've got stuff going on. So um, we actually, we're having a DJ come out this year. Um, right around dark at Havelina headquarters. Um, you know, the, the Jackass Junction Aid Station, if, if you've seen the Project Hilaria video, um, you kind of seen, it gets a little crazy out there. Um, and they've got music going, um, all kinds of things. But we wanted to kind of step up the main area this year and make it kind of more fun for crews, give them a little uh, flavor and taste of that. Uh, we've got um, a beer garden sponsored by Huss Brewing, which is a local brewery here in the Phoenix area. Um, and the proceeds from that are going to be going towards uh, Narawas, which is a, a nonprofit supporting the Taramara Indians of Copper Canyons. Uh, we've also got well, wood-fired pizza out there uh, for sale. 
and just, I guess, a lot of friends, like meeting new people. Um, we've got like so many great athletes coming um, and like even people that aren't running, they're just important in the sport. Like I know Craig Thornley is going to be there, the race director of Western States. Nice. Um, I just saw Ann Trayson actually just signed up for the 100K last night, right before registration closed. Um, That's she, awesome. sounds like she's, she had like a knee injury recently um, and some surgery, but she's going to come out and hike with a friend. And I think she's actually going to interview people for Trail Runner Nation while she's out on the course. So, uh, you know, it should be really fun and people will be able to kind of see, see each other out there uh, back and forth. That's amazing. Uh, what a cool experience. And, and the past winners include Casey Lichtai, Hal uh, Corner. I mean, you have a list of people who have run this race, who love this race, come back year after year. Carl Meltzer's uh, coming back this year. and He's the previous course record holder, so he'll be running. Yes. <laughs> you're, see, you're making me want to cancel New York entirely <laughs> and just come out to the desert. Um, uh, super bummed uh, that I will not be there, but hopefully we have something in the works that might uh, allow a little bit of fun. Uh, it, we'll, we'll have to talk about that uh, post-show because I'm pretty excited about it now, Jamil. Uh, so that's not the only thing that we've got going on. So have a lean 100. Put it on your list. If you are an ultra runner or you're looking for something to train for, something fun, something awesome, uh, and maybe registration is not closed, but uh, you can go out and, and help volunteer or something this weekend or even sign up for 2016 because the ginger will be there. Uh, I encourage you to, to, to look into it because it could be a good goal for a lot of people uh, to run this race and just a good race to run. And it's a Western States qualifier as well. Which is awesome. Uh, the 100K or the 100 mile? It's the 100 mile. Yeah. Okay. And that's a just finish and it's a qualifier? Yeah, finish under the cutoff. Okay, yep. cool. Um, so look into it. Research it, people. Uh, go to the website and see what you can do about maybe getting in next year. It would be really, really fantastic to see a lot of you guys out there. That's not the only thing that Jamil has going on. So this year has been a pretty damn big year for you, dude. Uh, the Slam of the Damned is what you're calling it, and I think it's a fitting title. Do you mind giving us a little explanation as to what the Slam of the Damned is? Sure. Uh, so I think like anyone about this time of the year, last year I was looking at my 2015 calendar, kind of, I guess, putting it together, dream races, and uh, decided to, you know, put my name in the hat for a bunch of lotteries, which I'm sure sounds pretty familiar right now. So, um, and actually, in fact, I just signed up for next year's Hard Rock. Um, you know, that is now open for registration for their lottery. So I'm debating. Um, I'm debating. <laughs> You got, that, you got that qualifier, Ethan? I do. <laughs> Cascade. Cascade. Oh, you should definitely do that. Um, no. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I put in for Hurt 100 um, in Hawaii. Uh, put in for Hard Rock, of course. Uh, I always do that one uh, if I can get in. Um, Mont Blanc has been on my list for quite some time, and I uh, decided to apply for that one this year. Um, and then I needed to return to Barkley. Um, you know, that one is kind of getting into my blood. So, you know, finishing three loops the year before, I wanted a, another crack at it. So, you know, I put in for all these lotteries, didn't really know what was going to happen. And then one by one, as they happened, I got into all these races. So um, I had four kind of like bucket list type 100 mile races um, on my calendar all in one year. And I just, I couldn't say no to doing them because you never know when you're going to get in again to some of these. So right. I, kind of, I think I was actually heading out to hurt and I just tweeted out, Hey, what would you call a slam of these four races? And, you know, people are just replying back, Oh, the pain slam or, uh, the lock, the lottery slam or the stupid slam, uh, whatever they, you know, whatever they would say. And Chris right. McDougall, actually the author of born to run is the one that he mentioned, he said slam of the damned and it just kind of instantly, um, kind of made sense to me. So that's kind of how I adopted the name. Uh, I think it's a very fitting name. Hurt 100, Barclays Marathons, Hard Rock 100, and UTMB. Uh, these four races, they, they, I have not experienced any of them in person, uh, but they all look and sound incredible. Um, how did they each... We, we had you on the show. We talked briefly about hurt and more about Barclays, but how do they all play out for you uh, in in real in reality as well as versus maybe what your mind wanted to occur? 
Yeah, I, well, I guess we'll start. I know we kind of touched on the first two in the last show, but like Hurt basically, um, it was more like a training run. I uh, just wanted to get out to Hawaii. <laughs> Hi, Kim. Is that her? Yeah, she, she just peeked her head in. Okay. Uh, hi. <laughs> uh, hi. Yeah, just use it as a training run for Barkley, kind of get things going for the year, uh, ramp up my training, and, and it worked out pretty well for that. So I uh, just kind of coasted the finish in there um, in about 30 hours, and then Barkley was more of a focus. I trained pretty hard for that one and was able to complete four loops this year. Uh, it was like the over the cutoff, so... Um, but was the last man standing. And then, um, yeah, Hard Rock and UTMB, I definitely wanted to focus on those. Um, you know, didn't quite get the training I had hoped to get in for them. Um, and also I suffered a bit of a, an injury three weeks before Hard Rock. So I was doing up there, I was doing my last kind of big long run. I was going to do about 40, I think 42 miles on the course. Um, and it was, there's a lot of snow this year up there. Um, if some people remember or seeing some of the posts, um, but like even into late June, I mean, there was significant snow. It, it all happened because in May there was just a lot of snowfall. Um, they were kind of light earlier in the year and then just got dumped on. Mm. Um, so you know, I was out on that run and streams and creeks that normally have no problem going across because of all the snow melt, they were just like raging rivers. Um, Oh, so, wow. like, I got to this one, it's called Pole Creek, and, like, I was by myself on this run, um, and this was a pretty remote section of the course, so I wasn't going to chance anything and try and, like, cross this river, and I tried, like, three or four times, like, I would kind of get my foot in and step across, and, you know, it's just, like, rushing past, and I didn't feel comfortable, um, and bailing on the run meant like kind of reversing back and it just seemed like not a good option either. So I kind of just went along the stream bank until I found like this big boulder on one side that was higher up. And then the other side, there's kind of like a landing pad, like a little grassy area. So I thought, you know, of course this is a smart idea, right? I'm going to jump the river. Um, <laughs> so that was my solution. You know, I'm not going to cross it. I'm going to jump it. Uh, and anyways, so I jumped the river, I made it, um, but then towards the end of the run, something didn't feel right with my ankle. It was kind of a little bit more sore than normal after like a 40 mile run. Yeah. Um, and next morning I just couldn't put any weight on it at all. So I was kind of hobbling around on my, with my trekking poles. Um, and I mean that by race day, I just, I had to like tape it, just tape it up. I stopped running. Um, taped it all up and just hoped for the best. And fortunately it, it didn't really bother me, um, the rest of the run. So that's good. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I remember you sharing that information that uh, when that occurred and it was like, no, I, I don't <laughs> want this to influence the slam of the damned. I want you to be able to finish, you know, all this stuff. Um, we had a good question kind of relating to this via Twitter and I'm, I'm loving the new Twitter inter integration feature. So I'm going to bring it up here. Uh, this tweet Ooh. comes from Tim Jarouse. I'm definitely pronouncing that wrong. Uh, Jamil, what steps did you take to prevent injuries while training for all four 100 milers this season? Uh, in this case, yeah, did you have any pre-injury training that you were doing to kind of avoid this kind of stuff? Or what did you do post, post-wise? Yeah, so in a normal season, I guess, I mean, I guess we all have a lot of races that are coming up, but... You know, I wanted to view this as a, like a whole picture of these four races is really my race. So I wanted to finish them all. That's the number one goal. Mm -hmm. um, so I kind of always had that in the back of my mind that like, I need to make sure that I'm in a condition where I can get to the finish line of all these events. Um, so I think that, you know, sometimes I would back off and, and take some downtime um, when maybe I normally wouldn't do that. Um, just kind of, and really pay attention to my body. Um, you know, Barkley was interesting because I don't know if it's really an injury, but I literally couldn't feel my toes for like four or five weeks after the race. Just, they were like numb just from all the pounding and the steepness of the hills out there. Wow. Um, and that eventually went away and like, they're fine now, but, um, that was, I had to really take it easy and, and let the recovery process happen after every single one of these events. 
you know, because some of them are close together. We had Hard Rock was only seven weeks before UTMB. So, you know, I wanted to be careful with that ankle. And I actually, I think, actually, it's not entirely true that it didn't bother me during the race. Um, actually, it did bother me um, now that I think about it more. And I think I was favoring that leg a bit. Okay. And that developed, uh, like, a, I think it was like a little bit of an IT band type of a thing. And also a shin issue. And so by mile 70, I couldn't really run anymore, uh, especially on the downhills, like literally could not run. Uh. So I just, I just walked and hiked and I, I was actually pretty strong on the up still. It, it wasn't bothering me there, but, um, so I'd kind of catch people or pass people. And then as soon as we hit the downhill, they would just, they would all pass me and like, um, I was with a friend up at the top of the last climb. You literally have maybe seven miles to the finish line. Mm. He put 45 minutes on me oh. uh, just because I, I couldn't run. I just walked. Yeah. Um, and I had my poles and just kind of going into the motion. And um, I don't know. There wasn't really much else to do, but I wasn't going to quit. I had time on the clock, um, and I knew I wanted to finish. So, you know, that was like it ended up being a 36-hour finish for me. Uh, which is my, it's my slowest out of my three. Um, but I'm really just, I'm happy to get the finish done. Um, you know, despite the kind of the injury setback and everything. Yeah. I mean, you've run hard rock a number of times. You suffered through hard rock a number of times. I've heard the stories. You've told the stories on the show before. How did this experience compare? It, it, it sounds like it wasn't so much a, you're going as hard as you can, but the race is fighting back. I mean, how did you handle the altitude, the climbing, all that kind of stuff? Was it primarily injury that kind of kept you uh, a little bit slower and prepping for UTMB in that sense? Yeah, definitely the injury was like during the race is what kind of kept me, held me back, I think there. Um, it was definitely the most difficult of, of the three that I've done. Um, you know, last time, two years ago, I had kind of that really bad blow up, but once I got back up, I was able to run like really strong all the way to the end. And that, you know, it was just not that, not the case this year. I was actually kind of moving up pretty good through halfway. And then, you know, things started uh, to unravel. Um, and it happens sometimes. Um, so you just got to kind of treat each race as it comes. And, um, you know, unfortunately, you know, I don't know if we still want to talk about hard rock more, but that, that injury did come back at UTMB. Um, I actually didn't have any issues in between. Like, um, I healed up. I recovered fairly quickly because I think I was going at a slower pace than normal. Mm -hmm. um, so I was able to get in some some training runs, and I actually ran the um, the Tushers 93K in Utah in between okay. those, um, and actually had a pretty good race. And it would kind of come and go a little bit, the feeling, but... You know, I ran pretty strong at the end and uh, it felt pretty good. Um, but then it, it definitely it came back in probably worse form at UTMB. Um, and that started about halfway through. Uh, <laughs> oh. So it was, um, it was a very much like a full on death march um, for half that race. Oh. Uh, before we move too quickly into UTMB, because yeah, yeah. uh, it already sounds like it's going <laughs> to. It's going to be uh, a, a hard story. Um, we have some good questions in the chat room. I want to remind those of you who are watching live, if you have a question for Jamil throughout the interview, uh, you can bring it into the chat room and just ask it. I'll try to grab it. Or you can tweet using the hashtag GRLive, and I can actually pull that up onto screen. So pick your poison. Uh, we have a question here from Lori Hall uh, asking Jamil, did you get any help with muscle soreness or injury with massage or ART or anything like that to cross train or reset? Oh, I'm sorry. I kind of mixed two questions there. Uh, did you get any um, uh, massage or anything like that or ART to help with these injuries in between races? Uh, I did not. Probably should have looked into that. <laughs> in that <laughs> um, yeah, no, I didn't. I kind of, um, I was talking to my coach and he said kind of, you know, give it a week or so to, to see how it's doing. And it kind of started improving. So I just kind of let, let it be, and um, I don't know. I think I probably just needed more time than seven weeks to let it fully heal. It seemed like the, you know, the hour runs I was doing or the couple long runs I was doing, and even the running for like 14 hours at 
in Utah was was okay for it. Um, and then even at UTMB, I was I was fine through like forty miles or halfway. I was running really strong, and then it just kind of it just went again. So we have a, another question, which I kind of was convoluting with the previous one, uh, mixing them together because the chat room was moving. This is from Tim. Uh, and it's going to piggyback of, off of Lori's question. Do you run year round or do you take a hard off season to cross train or reset? I take a, definitely an off season. I'm still running in that time period, but I don't have, a, like I currently don't have a coach right now. Um, kind of taking a little break. I don't put any sort of goals on myself. Uh, and that usually coincides with like September and October and really the lead up to having a hundred because it's just in the Flagstaff Sky Race is in there. It's just so crazy with uh, the preparations for that. I can't seriously focus on training right now just because I need to be fully, you know, focused and ready, ready for that. So, but then again, like I'll let, I'll do some runs. So like weekly I do, I lead a group run on Wednesdays. Um, I try and get a, a little bit of a longer run, probably mostly just for my sanity. Uh, on the weekends, you know, um, just went on one this weekend with some friends. Um, so I like, I do like to take an off season of a couple months, but it, it doesn't include absolutely zero running. Uh, I think that's just healthy mind and body wise. I, I think what you're describing, um, you've got good questions in the chat room and we've got some good questions on Twitter. I'm going to save them because I think some of these, uh, will probably come into play a little bit later. I want to start talking about UTMB. Uh, we have not talked to you since you you raced at UTMB. We've had a couple other guests on the show who were there, who did race. Uh, David Laney, um, it sounds like an incredible race. Uh, this is your final of the four Slam to the Damned hundreds. I guess this one's more of a 105 miler. Uh, extremely tough. A lot of climbing, a lot of descending. Um, let's kind of go through your UTMB experience, Jamil. Yeah, I mean, it's the biggest 100 mile race in the world. It has kind of the most media exposure and just the, I don't know, it's, it's tough to describe it, but it's just, you know, like the Tour de France, if it was a trail running race, is really the best way to, to describe it, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and I knew it's one I had to do at some point and just experience what they have going on out there. And it is, it's impressive. Um, and just the setting is spectacular. I mean, you're in Chamonix Valley, uh, Mont Blanc is just overhead. You've seen, there's glaciers that are kind of descending almost down to the valley floor. that are just a couple thousand feet above you. It's just, it's spectacular. Um, I arrived at night um, and my Airbnb like had a window that like I literally woke up that next morning. You just look up and then like Mont Blanc's right there. And like <laughs> these mountains that are just towering over you. It was, it was something else. Um, yeah. Never seen a place quite like that. Um, that was your first time there? Yeah, first time there. Um, so, yeah, and the race itself, you know, it has that weird 6 p.m. start time. Um, yeah. I was able to actually kind of sleep in all day. I woke up at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. I think I, I, got, I kind of arrived just before the race, so I didn't really adjust to the time zone, which I think was maybe a good thing in the end because, you know, I was pretty alert by the time we got around to starting that race. Um, and, you know, kind of the interesting thing about racing in Europe is they have like the mandatory gear and that's something that you don't often see in the U S and so even though the forecast was for like really warm, hot temperatures, we still had to carry all the required gear, which included space blanket, a certain ounce rainproof jacket, rainproof pants, tights. Um, beanie, warm gloves, like all this stuff, um, you know, and, you know, it's a little frustrating because it's like, ah, I don't want to carry all this stuff. Right. Uh, it's going to be on your back for, you know, for the really fast guys. Yeah. Maybe 21 hours. But for me this year is like 37 hours for some people it's 46 hours. So, um, you know, it's, it's a different experience and like, I, and out of all that warm gear, I think I, I was wearing just like a sleeveless shirt um, mm -hmm. when I started the race because it was super hot out, like we're just dripping sweat. Um, and I ended up putting a jacket on once in the first night for about 15 minutes. Otherwise, like everything just stayed in my pack. Oh, wow. <laughs> it stayed that warm throughout the evening. Yeah, I mean, it was a little chilly sometimes, but I just, I was, 
the first night I was running pretty strong, so it didn't bother me. Um, but yeah, it was it was warm. That's that's amazing. And yeah. you were so you were mentioning earlier that the injury from Hard Rock maybe carried over a little bit. When did it start uh, yeah. reeling its ugly head? Yeah, so I started out. I wanted to be conservative, obviously, um, especially just because I I just wanted to finish and um, just kind of ran super easy the first twenty. Um, and then I don't know, like it's the middle of the night now, and I just started picking it up a little bit. I felt really good. Um, and then you, I think what happens is by around like mile thirty, I was like really picking it up, and like you start thinking like you're just gonna feel this great forever, and your wheels start turning. You're like, okay, I, if I keep this pace up, I can pass these people. I can run this kind of time, and you know, that can, it's kind of a dangerous lesson to, to learn or something or a good lesson to learn because, um, that is, that's not how it played out. Right. Um, so I think it was around like mile 40, uh, 45 when I started noticing something was off. Um, I was running with, uh, Sally McRae at the time. Um, and also Nicole Studer. Um, and I was coming into, I think it's Cormier. I think that sounds right. It was in into Italy. It's about halfway point. The sun was just starting to come up, and I just couldn't run the downhills like I was earlier in the race. Right. I had to take it a little easier. I was noticing some soreness kind of down in my shin area, um, and it just it kind of just gradually got worse. Um, and basically, yeah, I didn't do much running for the rest of the race, like literally from mile fifty on. So it was. I would try and hike as hard as I could, um, or try and, I don't know, shift the weight to my other foot a little bit, but, um, yeah, I don't know. It, it definitely came back in full force. In this case, uh, it sounds like a situation that people have been in the past. Like other, I have been there where, where you're struggling at a point in a race where you just want to give up mentally. How were you doing as far as uh am i going to be able to finish this race was there ever any doubt you not only have this race uh, but you also have the bigger picture which is the slam of the dam did you have any of that kind of playing through your mind at that point i don't think i considered quitting ever um i was definitely frustrated because i was seeing how long it was taking me to you know get over a climb or in between aid stations and it's just like Oh my gosh, like how long am I going to be out here? Um, mm -hmm. I was originally hoping maybe I'd be done before the second night, before the second night starts, which would be like 27 hours. Um, and that, I mean, that went out the window pretty quick. And then it was like, okay, well, maybe sometime in the night, 30 hours, I don't know, 32 hours. And then, you know, it got dark again. And then next thing you know, like the sun's coming back up again. Like I went through two full nights out there. Um, and it was, yeah, I don't really know, but it just, it's like a really long, long experience. <laughs> Did you ever sleep? Did you take naps or anything like that? Um, I got really tired actually kind of just after all that stuff happened after core my air. So I took a couple little trail naps and then about maybe 30 minutes at an aid station. And that got me through that whole day. Um, and then about mile 70, I think it was, um, you come into a, another really big aid station. Um, and there, they actually had like little mattresses set up in this tent. And so I was kind of getting sleepy again. And, um, I thought I would take like a 40 minute nap. So I went in there, you know, took my shoes off, laid down 40 minutes was up. I woke up put the shoes back on, ate some food and got out of there. And that was probably the hardest thing to do because everything kind of tightens up and you're sore. Yeah. You know, I had kind of gotten more comfortable and you know, that night is coming up again and that, you know, it was going to be like a, a 30 mile walk and it was going to be really, you know, just really hard. So um, that was definitely probably the most difficult part of the race was like getting up and leaving that aid station. Um, yeah. Would you go back to UTMB? Um, I would go back, but I don't know if I would do that distance again. They have some other ones associated with it that whole week. Um, you know, I've got some other, I'd like to do other hundreds, I think. I don't, I don't know if I feel like I need 
you know, like a redemption to run like a faster time on that course. Um, and I got the experience I think that I was looking for. Um, but God, there's so many races out there. There's, there's a lot of really cool ones out there I'd love to do. Um, but I wouldn't be opposed to going back and being part of the atmosphere of that race and maybe doing one of the shorter ones. Um, they also have a longer one, which is appealing. It's like 300 kilometers. I think that one's called yeah. PTL. Uh, and you do it with a partner. Um, that would be a fantastic experience, I think. Yeah, I've, I've actually heard the same thing from other people that CCC gets you all the sites, gets you all the, the climbs that you wanted uh, to conquer without having to do, I think, 20 or 30 miles of certain road sections or something like that. Someone said, oh, it's just it's the best option of the three or the long, long version. Uh, I don't know. It sounds epic. Yeah. It sounds amazing. Yeah, regardless. CCC would probably be the one I would do because especially for me and like the time I was at. A yeah. lot of that last section was all in the dark. So, I mean, you can, the, we did have a full moon that night, so I could kind of see the mountains, but it'd be really nice to get through that section all in the day and maybe feeling better where you can actually, actually run some of that stuff. I think it would be really spectacular. So I think, um, I think I might maybe look into that one um, in the future at some point. Uh, regardless, you managed to complete Hurt 100 uh, you were the last man standing at Barclays Marathons, which is which is a lot, see, seeing as uh, how few people have ever finished that race. I won't, I won't even call it a race, the adventure of Barclays Marathons. Uh, you finished Hard Rock 100. You finished UTMB. You finished the Slam of the Damned, uh, <laughs> the very first person to ever do that, I, I believe. And uh, how does it feel? Uh, how are you mentally now compared to where you were beforehand? Are you relieved? Is it giving you the confidence for future endeavors? Oh yeah. I mean, it feels great to kind of set that goal and to get it done. Um, I mean, yeah, Barkley would have been nice to get that fifth loop in. Um, hopefully in the future that does happen. Um, yeah, it feels good. I mean, um, it was, you know, you, I think hard rock and UTMB both were some of the most difficult to finish races I've ever done. Mm -hmm. Um, and they definitely taught me a lot in terms of just like perseverance. Um, because, like 36 and 37 hours is a long time. So, um, yeah, it just changes your perspective on like hours and days and, and everything. <laughs> what do you think was like the lowest point of the whole series? Oh man. Um, I don't know. Some of the middle part of UTMB when it was, it was just so far away. Um, grand, I, I wish I knew the names better, but like, Grand something Cole. I don't know. It was like somewhere in Italy about to go into Switzerland. It was one of the biggest climbs on the course there or the high point of the course maybe. And I just like, I would like take a few steps and sit down and like, it was really hot. Take a few steps and sit down. I don't know. That was pretty low. Um, getting up and over that one. I don't know. Was finishing UTMB cathartic? Did you allow the moment to, to sink in that you had completed this personal goal of yours? Or what, at that moment, was it just all about UTMB and finishing that day? Or those two days? Yeah, I definitely remember thinking a little bit like, this is awesome. Like, the series is done. Like, kind of relief that it's over a little bit, um, but also just relishing in the accomplishment. Um, you know, and I think I did run the last like couple hundred yards. Like I somehow, you know, the adrenaline takes over and you can just do anything for at least a short amount of time. Um, but, you know, it was a little bit different than maybe I was imagining because you think like UTMB, there's going to be like, you know, a thousand people cheering for you as you're coming across the finish line and announcer going crazy. Yeah. Um, but like this was seven in the morning <laughs> after like everyone was out partying all night. So in reality, like the streets were deserted. Um, there's a couple people at the finish line, um, you know, like clapping and, and I think they say your name. So, um, little like anticlimactic, I guess. Um, and then like, fortunately, uh, I think like Victor Ballesteros was right there. Yeah. Um, and I hitched a ride with him in his car to get over to my Airbnb, which is like a mile away. Cause I don't think I could have made that walk. Ugh. That would have uh, sucked to finish oh 105 miles and have to walk to your Airbnb. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we have uh, some good questions here as well. This is this is a great question, Kimasabe. 
Did you have to carry your passport with you when you ran, when you crossed the borders? Yes, you do have to carry identification papers. So I had my passport in my pack the whole time. They never asked me for it. And actually, I honestly don't know where the actual borders were. Um, there wasn't like any sort of station or, or marker, um, but we did have to carry them. One of the, laun the laundry list of required gear. <laughs> Uh, well, honestly, dude, Jamil, such a huge accomplishment, man. Uh, I can't imagine any other person on the planet having completed this at this point. I think you're the only person to have done all four of these races. Um, next year, will you be going back to any of these races next year? I, I hope to go back to Barkley next year. Um, that would be probably if, if I could go back to any, that would be the one I would like to go back to. And this will be um, your third time, right? Yeah. Third year, um, so yeah, I, I'll definitely apply for that and kind of see what happens. Um, and then I did put my name in the hat for Hard Rock. Just wanted to see, you know, I I've always I always apply for that one. It's been like eight years, so. We have a good question here on Twitter from Kelly. Uh, I didn't I didn't forget it, Kelly. How will you modify your Barkley strategy for 2016? You just mentioned that you would like yeah. to go back, uh, especially sleep deprivation, which I know on your final lap, I think played a huge part, or at least the time you were out there on the final lap. <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, number one is going to be training related, and it's going to be to up the vertical in my training. So weekly vertical, like number of feet climbed. I'm um, hoping to increase that. I think I was like 15 to 20,000 average for maybe, I think I started in like February with that. So that was maybe only, you know, six, seven weeks. Um, this year, you know, if go, all goes according to plan, I would start more like December 1st and build up to where I'm doing about 30,000 feet of vertical climbing a week. Um, as far as sleep deprivation training, I think I was, I was thinking about this on a run this weekend. And um, I think the number one goal would be to, um, just get, I guess, more consistent sleep for like a period of weeks or even months before the race. Mm -hmm. um, I really struggle with that sometimes. Like I'll, you know, just with, I think it's difficult with like race directing everything. You sometimes you're just up all night, you're working or you get into a project and um, you're not sleeping normal hours. You're not sleeping uh, consistently any number of hours. So I'll, you know, I'll kind of get strung out and sleep two, three, four hours a night and like crash one day a week and sleep, you know, maybe 12. Um, you know, and last year yeah, I was race directing. I actually, our company put on a race the same day as Barkley. Um, so I was doing a lot of work for that in the, in the week leading up to it and sacrificed a good bit of sleep. So um, that would be my main um, sleep depri deprivation training. Um, I do enough of like staying awake for long periods of time just day to day, but I think the, right. and, and not just trying to catch up like in the last two days or three days before the race, but consistently over a period of time getting, you know, however much sleep I need, um, on a consistent basis. Do you think, uh, doing regular naps or regular sleep cycles in Barclays is, is an important key? From what I've read of people that have finished the race and had success there, it seems like taking a couple naps that are like, like planned and scheduled at camp is a good idea because mm -hmm. it helps to keep your mind clearer and give your body a little rest. Um, usually they'll do it after loop three and after loop four, they'll try and get a little bit. Actually, I think some of you did it after loop two, um, but I don't know. We'll just have to see, um, you know, how that would play out, but I would definitely, and it also depends too. Like if, if you have issues and, in navigating and you lose a couple hours out there on a loop right there that just cuts your sleep away and, and that's a little bit of what happened on loop two this last year you know i led some people in the wrong direction um, looking for book two and we you know we lost i don't know how much we lost maybe a half hour 45 minutes um, and you start doing and we then we couldn't later find i think book five we were having some issues so it's like you know that any navigational errors that's literally cutting into your sleep time. Yeah. Uh, I, someone was bringing up some facts here in, in the chat room just to talk about 
your vertical gain over the course of this year. Uh, and just in comparison, in 2015, I have climbed uh, just over 300,000 feet in 231 runs. Jamil has climbed, <laughs> oh, I just scrolled by it. 349,875 feet, Jamil. Jesus Christ. <laughs> that's a that's a lot of climbing. And what's different is that a lot of that is coming from races. Because I think you did a lot of training leading up to Hurt and Barclays. But then in between all the, like, between Hard Rock and between UTMB, you weren't doing the same sort of elevation workouts, right? Yeah, no, definitely not. Um yeah, more traditional training, probably. That's yeah. insane. And the year's not even out yet. It's not even done. <laughs> I, uh, I can't. I can't even fathom that that uh, that volume of elevation and mileage total. What is the next big project for you? What What's next on your list of projects? For run running wise. Yeah, running wise. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I mean, I don't. I'm not signed up for any more races this year. Um, well, I'm, we're doing a Ragnar Trail just locally. Um, but I think like the next race would probably be Barkley next year. Um, I'm not planning on signing up for anything before then. So just kind of, I guess, you know, just try and train for it. See if, see how that would go. It's going to be epic. Uh, I can't wait to follow your adventures, man. Uh, 2015 has been an, an absolutely stellar year for you. I know that individually each race is like, Oh, probably a, a nightmare of a memory. But the reality <laughs> is you completed four of the hardest 100s on the planet in the same year. Uh, are you going to add Badwater 135 to your list? Because people have called me out numerous times on never giving Badwater the claim as one of the hardest 100s. I don't, I've never experienced it, so I wouldn't. Uh, are they saying it, they're saying it is or it isn't one of the it hardest? Is, I, whenever I say, oh, it's one, you know, these 100s are some of the hardest on the planet. Yeah, yeah. I'll see so comments like weeks later, like, you never talk about Badwater, and that's the <laughs> hardest. And I'm like. Tell me, tell me after you've run it. Uh, I'm sure right. it, it seems I would never run Badwater because it sounds terrible. It sounds so it's hard. Really, it's really fun to crew. I've crewed that one a couple times. That's a great experience. It's like you're hanging out with everyone in the car the whole time. You get out and do some miles. Um, and it Death Valley is actually a really beautiful place, especially at night, like under the stars. It's yeah, it's awesome. Um, that one. I mean, that one's not on my list currently. Um, you know, I would love, I don't, I don't know how 2016 is going to play out yet. I mean, I'd love to get out and do um, one of these years, uh, Ronda del Sims, which is mm. around the country of Andorra, the Spanish Pyrenees. Um, that one looks spectacular. It's got uh, a race that has more climbing than Hard Rock. And then a race that just happened, and it's, um, it's also part of the Ultra Trail World Tour, um, which UTMB is a part of as well, as the Diagonal de Fou on Reunion yeah. Island, which is in the... Um, in the Indian Ocean, that one looks pretty amazing as well. Really difficult jungle run, right? Like it's mostly jungle stuff. Yeah, like yeah, you run across this you know really big island. Um, so yeah, jungle, tons of climbing, and I guess from what I understand, it's just like the culture, uh, the people that are there. Like you know, it's just the whole. It's kind of like you know these. It's almost any island race. It seems is like this. Like the whole entire country or island is like part of it. Like a Transvolcania. You know, everyone comes out. They're just like crazy fans, like climbing up on the mountains just to see the runners go by. Um, it looks pretty spectacular, um, and just I mean, the travel there looks insane. I don't even know how you would get there, but um, it definitely looks really, really cool. Yeah, all of those uh, Grand Canaria and Grand Transvolcania and all that stuff. I'm like, how do you how do you get there? Like, how, <laughs> how are the logistics involved in that? Because it sounds it sounds pretty brutal. Uh, Regardless, Jamil, you've had an incredible season. Um, it's not quite over yet. You have Havelina coming up this weekend. You're not running it, but I know that you, as the race director, will probably be throughout the course. Uh, I can't wait to experience Havelina for myself. Um, any last words, or where can people find out more information on Havelina, or at least follow you and find out more information about you? Let's let's give people uh, some of yeah. that. Well, you can find me on Twitter or Instagram, Jamil Curry. Uh, post runs on Strava. Right now I'm taking a Strava break, but probably be back here soon. Um, as far as Havelina goes, you can go to our website, Havelina 100. We also have, uh, we'll have live updates during the race, Aravipa running Twitter uh, and Instagram. We'll be posting pretty active on those as well. 
Um, and well, Ultra Sports Live, uh, I get make a plug for them. They will they will be out there doing pre and post race interviews as well as um, doing some live webcam uh, work during the day. Uh, can't wait to follow from afar. Seriously, thinking about just canceling New York altogether and just coming out to the <laughs> desert uh, to have some party and fun with you guys. Uh, if you're watching live, please go follow Jamil, follow Air Viper Running. Uh, seems to be a really cool thing that they have going on there in the Arizona desert. And you will definitely want to follow Havilene Hunter this weekend because it, it, it's a blast. It sounds like it's a freaking party on Halloween weekend. Is it always Halloween? Yeah, so we're, we stick to like the weekend closest to Halloween. So it's within a few days, either direction. Okay, cool. Uh, I keep it that way. That sounds rad. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So that, that is going to be it for today's regular show. Uh, stick around. We're going to do a little quick post show with Jamil. Um, some, some post show banter for those of you who are watching live or watching on YouTube at the archive version. Again, I really appreciate you guys tuning in every Monday, 6 PM Pacific. It's really cool to watch the chat room, come back and pick up conversations where they left off in the previous week or, or they use it as a way to like, Hey, what's going on? And, I had some good ideas tonight in the chat room talking about bringing up a forum or doing some sort of ginger runner forum on the website where people can communicate throughout the week. Uh, it's something I've been considering for a while and maybe maybe we'll do it sooner than later just because I think uh, I think it's cool that everyone comes back week after week and recognizes each other's usernames and stuff like that. Why not have a place where people can congregate, talk about running, talk about what they're going through, what they're de dealing with training and, and being able to talk to people like Jamil, uh, an expert in the field who's been training for a long time and racing tons of really difficult global races uh it'd be cool to pick pick minds like his uh so that's it for today's show thank you so much for tuning in live go follow jameel totally worth it the guy posts really amazing photos and also video work are we when are we going to expect another video from from jameel productions oh man um i mean the the videos have taken a little bit of a back seat to everything else going on but oh, sure, yeah. uh, I, mean, I, I probably have enough footage of races I've filmed throughout this year to make like 12 videos. So hopefully after Havelina, I get some time to, you know, pull up the Premiere Pro and uh, get to work. So um, I, well, I actually did make a behind the scenes video of us course marking the Flagstaff Vertical K course. Nice. That should be up on the Air Vipa YouTube channel soon. Um, yeah, I'd love to do some more of that coming up. It's definitely uh, something I admire about Jamil because not only is he a badass runner, a badass race director, but he also films uh, and edits all of his own stuff and puts it up on his YouTube channel or Air Vipa's YouTube channel. So definitely want to check that stuff out. And hopefully there will be a, a Jamil Curry Ginger Runner collaboration coming up very, very soon. Um, so stick, stick around for the post show, but then uh, keep your ears and eyes peeled for more information on that, I guess is, is a good way to put it. Uh, so that's it for the regular show, guys. You know where to follow me across social networks. If you want to contribute to the channel, join us on patreon.com slash the ginger runner and uh, help contribute uh, some information going to the Patreons tonight. Very exciting stuff. So you won't want to miss that if you are a Patreon supporter. Uh, we're going to be doing a Patreon live later this week. It's going to be the second uh, this month, which I'm excited about. We're going to talk about a lot of stuff, including ginger miss which I'm very stoked about this year. Ginger Miss is going to be huge. And uh, those of you who may not be on the Patreon side, you will not want to miss it. I will post all this information uh, on Facebook and Twitter and all that stuff. So make sure that you follow across the board. Let's move on to the post show. Talk to more. Talk to more of, to, of the Chub Jamil. Let's do that. Okay? Move to the post show. Here we go. <laughs> Awesome. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so we've had tons of like really good talk in the chat room to me. A lot of people asking specific questions as to like, how should I train for this sort of event? Uh, one of which was asked much earlier. I didn't ask it during the live show because I wanted to save it for the post show. Uh, someone, I uh, forget, I don't want to scroll up. I think it was either Tim or, or I forget who it was in the chat room. They're starting their 100K at 12 a.m. Do you have any advice for someone who's starting a race? that's overnight. So any sort of overnight running advice that you would give to runners? Yeah, well, that sounds like it's probably Hellgate 100K. Um, it might have been Hellgate. Uh, uh, I'll have to scroll up and see. Starts. Anyways, um, yeah, so I mean, we host uh, an entire tr night trail running series over the summer here in Arizona. It's called the Insomniac uh, Night Series. So uh, for races starting then, I kind of, you know, recommend 
you kind of have to think about things a little bit differently because normally we eat dinner, we go to sleep, we wake up the next morning, we've kind of digested our meal. So you kind of want to adjust your meal uh, plan a little bit. Um, you know, eat maybe a little bit of a bigger lunch and then maybe just something lighter within like a couple hours of your run just so you're not, you don't want to eat like a full dinner and then go race. Um, that would probably be the biggest thing. Uh, the other thing about night running that I think is probably one of the most important things is invest in a quality light. There's nothing worse than not being able to see out there. Um, yeah. You know, you can have a real advantage when, you know, if you have someone with a, a dinky light um, that's not reliable and you have like a, you know, you can get some pretty impressive lights these days. There's some really great technology out there. If you can light up that trail and to the point where it's almost daylight, um, you're going to be able to see all those rocks and roots so much better um, than anyone else. Um, and that's going to be a bit of an advantage for you. We had, um, uh, actually, before I forget, hey, Kim. Kim, yeah. can you grab one of my wraps? Just any one of them, just right there. Sorry, she's, uh, Kim is cooking dinner, so there's, she's in there, like, focusing on dinner. Uh, so I had to grab her attention real quick. I want to I want to show you guys something in, in a couple of minutes. Uh, great advice. Headlamps, I totally agree. Thanks, babe. Um, I've been using the Petzl now, and I used it at Cascade. And just having that extra loom extra luminance yeah luminance. Um, having the extra lumens <laughs> awesome like being able to light up the trail outside of that circle of just the single track like being able to see a little bit peripherally helped so uh it helped exponentially in kind of keeping you from having the tunnel vision i remember that specifically more alert too you know yeah. when you get tired if you can see more light it, i think it's a little more visually stimulating and I, I say Petzl now, I know it's very expensive. There are other headlamps out there that give you tons of lumens. So I think the most lumens you can get for your dollar, I think is the most benefit. Uh, it's when you start getting super narrow beams of light that like what Jamil was saying, um, it can keep you entertained and it can keep the, the trail visible. But I think having that wider scope helps keep things a little bit more engaging. I don't know, it really helped trucking me through the night. I remember that. This question uh, for Jamil is from Jeff. Hey, Jamil, when your training load increases, preparing for these big races, do you find yourself exhausted all the time? If so, how do you deal with it? He struggled with it this year himself. Yes, I do find that that happens. I remember, um, yeah, training for Barkley, doing like, you know, God knows how many repeats in a row. Um, and it, like, just being like hungry and starving, like, yeah, almost every night after I'd be done running, um, like not only like exhausted, but also just, yeah, hungry, like your metabolism kicks up. Um, so I don't know, you just have to kind of listen to your body. Um, I would, I'd go out and grab like, I mean, I'm, I'm a vegan, so I would go and grab like some soy ice cream, like almost every night and just eat like a bunch of soy ice cream bars, just get some more calories in. Maybe not the most healthy thing, but it did, it definitely helped temporarily, you know, that, fill the void. I don't eat them every day now, oh, but, but they're soy uh, delicious. Jamil. They soy delicious. Yeah. They're so soy good. Um, exactly. And yeah, I mean, sometimes, yeah, you just, you got to sleep more, um, and, and be okay with that. And if you're going to train for some of these events, you know, you have, you got to commit to them and it's going to take more time both on the running side, but I think often overlooked is, the recovery and making sure you're giving yourself enough time to sleep and let that work you're doing out on the trails absorb and and actually benefit from it. Uh, now people are talking about the headlamp thing. Um, I've also done the headlamp and the handheld because it helps uh, mix up the shadows. Because if you have a light coming from this source here, it casts it casts a shadow that your eyes can't see, so everything kind of loses its depth. So people have worn headlamps around their waist or carried a handheld uh, flashlight in addition to a headlamp with extra lumens, which is great. Uh, that was that's super beneficial. It, if you're if you're running a race at night or using a night section, having a pacer during that section, it's great for them to carry the handheld and kind of mix up the shadows a little bit. That way, you don't have to carry the extra weight. That was my last piece of advice on that. Uh, I wanted to talk a bit about. Um, 
uh, Jamil has really great merch and merchandise and hats and cool gear. The Run Steep Get High gear. Where can people find that, Jamil? Because I still have my Run Steep Get High hat. I, I don't think it's in here, uh, <laughs> which I wear quite frequently. Where can people find that stuff? Where can people get it? Because I, I know yeah. people have always asked. Yeah, you can get it online, runsteep.com. We have a web store there. Um, ships out of my house. So I try and get orders out you know, two to three times a week on that. Um, all, everything's up there right now. Um, if you're coming to Havilene 100, we will have almost everything there. We have like hoodies and thermal, uh, thermal shirts, hats, stickers, uh, beanies, all kinds of stuff. And you know, a lot of that, um, it helps to support a lot of the video work that we, that we do. I just, um, I was able to purchase a little bit better camera this year. So, uh, definitely, you know, and it's subscribed to that channel as well. The run steep, get high. That's really, I really want to push that, especially into the fall of next year and get, you know, some really good content going on there. I'm really excited about, um, kind of doing more video work. So, um, you know, when you guys kind of purchase some gear, it definitely helps to support the, the video work that we do. Um, really excited about some of that stuff. How's the new camera working out for you? Good. Um, it's got, I haven't actually edited anything with it. Um, mm -hmm. But I mean, some of the slow motion work it does, just awesome stuff. I have been basically soaking myself in camera info over the last few weeks yeah. because my gear is, is it's old. It's completely obsolete. I want to up my game. Uh, and a big part of that, while of course, I think all filmmaking comes down to storytelling 100%, uh, it'd be really nice to to have a piece of gear that I that I feel pride in. And Jamil got an amazing camera, uh, a GH4, which I'm really excited to kind of see some of the footage and, and hear how it works, man, because I've been looking at that as, as well as like 10 others. There's just so <laughs> much out there, but nothing is quite perfect yet. Uh, it, it's really, really interesting. Uh, yeah. I wanted to tease this. This is, uh, this is the new head wrap and I have a bunch of them and they will be for sale. It, talking about merchandise, it really does help Jamil and it really does help Ginger Runner and it helps our brands basically function. It, it basically helps uh, keep the lights on and, and get film equipment and help things happen. Uh, these will be for sale within the next 14 days on the website. Uh, you will not miss out because I got plenty. I think I got plenty this time, hopefully. Uh, hopefully enough. Last time they sold out within seconds. So hopefully I got enough to, to not let that happen. Uh, but I will be making announcements on Facebook, on Twitter, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and make sure that you support Jamil as well and Air Viper Running and Run Steep Get High. Uh, it really does make a big difference. Um, because like you said, Jamil, you're you're basically packaging stuff up and shipping it straight out of your, your house. It's all, yeah. it's you. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, right now it's me. Yep. Printing, printing those shipping labels, getting them out there. So, um, yeah. When I was shipping out the hats, the Ginger Runner camp caps, I remember mm -hmm. posting a picture and Jamil's texting like, tell me you have a label printer or some sort of printer to print uh, the shipping labels. And I sent him a picture of our printing label, which we had just got because printing labels for that many <laughs> orders, uh, but like on sheets of paper, that would that sucks. <laughs> Could you imagine with like the Sharpie, you know, like writing every name on there and then going to the post office with like 500 orders or something? Here, take this. I hope I didn't misspell anything or, <laughs> or spell an address wrong. Uh, yes, label printers are saving saving our gourds. Uh, so I really appreciate all of you guys tuning in live um, week after week. It was really great to have Jamil on tonight. I know that he's got a busy week ahead of him planning and getting everything ready for, for Havilene 100. Uh, for those of you who are watching live, tune in next Monday. Uh, we'll do a New York Marathon race recap. I'll be traveling to New York on Thursday to run the New York Marathon. Again, I'm super excited. Uh, ASICS is bringing me out. I'll be part of Team ASICS. And there was a question in the chat room about which shoes I'll be running in. And uh, they let me try out a bunch of their, their shoes. And the one pair that really works well is the 33FA, which is their cushion minimal trainer. And uh, I'm really into it. So I'll be most likely running the marathon on that shoe because it's it surprised me with its overall comfort. And I'll be reviewing it soon, too. Uh, but I'm really excited to go back to New York and run the marathon. I'm a little nervous. Uh, people asked if I'm going for PR. Jamil, you can probably attest to this. Uh, have you run roads or, like, done a road marathon? Not recently, but at all. I, I have never done a road marathon. Um, 
yet. So I've done, you know, up to, I've done a half marathon on the roads. Um, but actually I was, um, I met some people from uh, November Project that are actually part of the one in New York City. And they were trying to get, tell me I should come out and run New York one of these years. The only problem is it's, you know, this year it's the same exact weekend as Catalina, so it'd be impossible. But I think next year it's like staggered by one week. So um, I think that would be, that seems like a really fun one. You ran it last year, right? I ran it last year. It is incredible. As far as road races are concerned, I've done a number of the big city ones. I haven't done like Chicago or in London or Berlin or any of the big ones, but uh, New York, it was, Kim was with me. It's overwhelming. Like it's insane how many spectators come out to watch. Every mile is like three or four people deep. I mean, every single foot of that race is three or four people deep. It's crazy. So I, I, I originally put out there, oh, I'd love to PR the marathon, thinking in my mind, oh, I'm coming off of a really good year of training and racing. Like I did my first hundred. This is a great opportunity to take 26 miles on the road and really push them. And the more that I've been trying to get back into road running, the more I'm like, oh, I am slow. Like I got slow this year. So I don't think a PR is in the cards at New York. Because also New York is a hilly one, dude. It it, it actually has uh, more hills because of the bridges than, than I remember. Um so I don't right. think I'll be going for a PR for the marathon. For those of you, uh, for those of you who asked, I'll probably be going for a course PR, uh, which I think was three forty six last year. So I'm going to try to beat that this year. I'm going to really give it my all because I think the weather is going to be perfect. I hope. The other challenge, and Jamil, let me know if you have input on this. They have outlawed selfie sticks and outlawed race vests, so I cannot wear. I was going to wear a minimal Solomon race vest so I could keep my selfie stick hidden, but they outlawed those and they outlawed selfie sticks. So I can't have any sort of camera holding apparatus. The only thing that they're allowing is either a chest mount or a head mount. And I'm debating either not filming at all and just focusing on having a good race, which I do anyways, even when I do film or trying to like, just carry my GoPro in my hand and hope that the <laughs> footage is usable. Uh, any input like have you ever had to sneak a camera into a race i i have not had to sneak one i mean i guess you have to just use the whole like arm thing and hope it's hope it's good uh i don't know we'll see sounds like a challenge <laughs> it's gonna be an interesting challenge uh i hope i don't make a video that makes everybody nauseous that's pretty much the the, the ultimate goal uh okay that's it enough blibber blathering Good term. Uh, I appreciate you guys all tuning in live tonight. And again, Jamil, thank you, man, for joining me on the show tonight. Can't wait to get you back and and keep me posted what happens this weekend at Havelina. Really excited to, to follow along from afar. And if you're watching live, tune in next Monday, 6 p.m. Pacific. See you guys then. That's it. Bye.